Shalom from Israel. I'm Shira Sokoram reporting to you from Tel Aviv, and I want to welcome you to Israel Frontline, your guide to Israel and the Middle East. We want to give you a biblical perspective on political and social current events in Israel as they happen and why they happen. What you will hear on this program will contrast sharply with the biased reporting we are receiving from most of the world media. Today we begin a four-part series on events that led up to the rebirth of Israel. On this program, we will examine what the land was like before the creation of the modern state of Israel and the transformation that happened once Jews began returning to their ancient home. On the program today, how Mark Twain's description of Israel coincides with prophecy. Who owns this land? The difference between early Jewish and Arab communities in Israel. And later, our panel will join me in the studio to discuss the subject of Israel's physical and spiritual restoration. When Mark Twain walked through the land of Israel in 1867, he describes a desolate and sparsely populated wasteland. In his own words, this was, quote, a desolate country whose soil is rich enough but is given over wholly to weeds, a silent, mournful expanse, a desolation. We never saw a human being on the whole route, hardly a tree or shrub anywhere. Even the olive tree and the cactus, those fast friends of a worthless soil, had almost deserted the country, end of quote. The words of the famous American author echo those of the prophets of the Old Testament who promised that the land of Israel, God's promised land, would be desolate, empty, and barren. Indeed, the prophet Jeremiah foretold, I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins, a haunt of jackals, and I will lay waste the towns of Judah so that no one can live there. Israeli historian Professor Benny Morris records that in the early 19th century, the population living in what is now Israel was less than 300,000 people total. They lived in scattered small villages and in small walled towns. In comparison today, in this same area, there are 8 million citizens in the state of Israel and over three million more under the Palestinian Authority and in the Gaza Strip. Back in the 19th century, the land was uncultivated in many areas. The village's inhabitants, who were predominantly Arab, practiced traditional agriculture methods and were mostly located in areas where there were fertile land. But much of the country was simply uncultivated. That is not to say it wasn't owned by anyone. By that time in history, most of the land in the region was claimed by someone. Most was owned by wealthy landowners living outside of Israel and worked by locals who paid a share of the crops to the landowners. Contrary to the present, the whole land of Israel was not at all an important place. It was in fact a poor backwater region in a crumbling empire. The Arabs, including nomads and migrating Bedouin, who lived in the land, were not Palestinian. In fact, they were not part of any uniform group. The allegiance of each person was to his family, then his clan, then the village, and that's about it. They were part of the Ottoman Empire, but that wasn't much more than a technicality for most. In his book, The Iron Cage, the prominent Palestinian historian Rashid Khalidi notes the lack of cohesiveness and sense of community in the Arab population compared with that of the Jewish population. He asserts this was one of the main causes for their defeat in the armed struggles between Jews and Arabs 
throughout the early 20th century and during the 1948-49 War of Independence. The Jews in the land, on the other hand, had a very strong collective identity. The small group of Jews who lived here before the large waves of immigration began were a tight-knit community, and those who joined them came strongly motivated to cultivate the land and ultimately create a nation for the Jewish people. Throughout the centuries, the remnant of Jews living in the land resided almost entirely in the cities, mostly Jerusalem, Tiberias, Hebron, Safat, and the coastal port of Jaffa. Many more Jews would have been living in the Holy Land, but during their four-century rule, the Islamic rulers of the Ottoman Empire always made it difficult for Jews and other non-Muslims to immigrate and prosper in the ancient land of Israel. In the late 1800s, Jews began to return to the Holy Land in numbers not seen since the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. The Jews who arrived from abroad came with the intention of creating a homeland for their people. They purchased large plots of land from Arab landowners, which in many cases were almost worthless in the eyes of the owners. The land that was sold was rarely in the fertile areas, which was already used for agriculture. These areas were often swamps infested with malaria-carrying mosquitoes, or lands that were too barren for the primitive agriculture methods. The Jews who purchased these properties spent years drying the swamps, fighting malaria, and developing agriculture methods that are now used globally. Some of the most fertile lands in Israel today were once swamps, and much of the coastal area are used to grow citrus fruits which survive in this low nutrient soil. Some of the communities ventured out into the desert and began developing new methods of agriculture and types of plants that could survive the intense heat and scarce water. Simply said, the Jews who arrived in Israel changed the face of the country with years of hard work, determination, and stubborn faith in a wonderful way fulfilling God's promise to restore a land of milk and honey a land of prosperity to the people of Israel. The Jews returning to the Holy Land in large numbers from the 1880s and onward were coming back to fulfill their national destiny. This awareness to their calling is clear in the words of the founders of the modern Zionist movement who saw themselves as continuing the ancient Jewish presence in the land. And even today's descendants of those early pioneers see themselves as a continuation of the Second Temple Jewish community. They have built their towns and villages on many of the same locations where Jewish communities existed 2,000 years ago. From the Palestinian point of view, they contest the Jewish connection to the land, claiming that they were the ones who inhabited the land for centuries, and the Jews are simply newcomers. This is far from the truth. The fact is the Palestinians certainly did not exist as a people. The majority of those who today claim to be the indigenous people of the land actually arrived from neighboring Arab regions after the Jewish immigrants because of the financial prosperity the land was experiencing with the arrival of the Jews from Europe. The return of the Jews in the 19th and 20th century is directly linked to the supernatural restoration of the land that we see today. This is not just a spiritual concept, but one that is easily proven over the past century, the very earth of Israel has undergone a dramatic transformation. From a scarcely inhabited and uncultivated land, we've become a nation with a booming population and economy, a land in which the desert 
is being overtaken by agriculture. What was once swamplands and deserts are today bustling cities and suburbs. There are those today, specifically those promoting a Palestinian narrative, who will try and diminish the absolute miracle of the people of Israel returning to the land since the 19th century. Their return is fulfilling a 3,000-year-old prophecy in a most miraculous way. The Jewish people have triggered a supernatural recovery of the land of Israel that in turn transformed the nation's capability to sustain population and opened the land for even more Jewish immigrants. It was the physical appearance of Jews in great numbers that triggered God's promises into action. Those who claimed the Jews were outsiders or Western imperialists coming to the land are simply ignoring the facts. Looking at the last 100 or so years of history is an awe-inspiring lesson in God's faithfulness to His plan and promise. We have seen the land flourish, the Hebrew language spoken again, the people return from the four corners of the world, and values found in the Bible once again practiced in the halls of government. For Israel and for all who wait upon God's word to be fulfilled, here are the words of hope from the prophet Amos, who foretold the miraculous restoration of this nation. And I will bring my people Israel back from exile. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine and they will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them. Stay tuned. We will be right back to discuss the miracle of Israel's physical restoration with our panel of guests. Maos Israel Ministries is a Messianic Jewish nonprofit organization based in Tel Aviv. We exist to be a witness of the good news to the people of Israel through outreach, discipleship, and raising up godly leaders. We translate and publish outstanding faith books in Hebrew and powerful testimony books to reach non-believers. We have a Hebrew outreach website with original media content produced by our team. We support the Hebrew-speaking congregation Tiferet Yeshua in Tel Aviv. We sponsor and host seminars and conferences. We support our Arab Christian brothers who love Israel and the God of Israel. Our I Stand with Israel Fund serves as a benevolence outreach, meeting the practical needs of Israeli believers. Our dream is to see God's promises fulfilled until the day when all Israel will be saved. If you want cutting-edge information about the end times, sign up for Shira Sokharam's newsletter. I have been reading it for years, and as far as I'm concerned, it was the only one newsletter I would read having to do with end-time Bible prophecy right from Israel. It would be the Maos newsletter. Sign up today. Welcome back to Israel Frontline. We now turn to our panel for discussion. Today in the studio with me are three Jerusalemites. Mati Shoshani, Director of Operations for TBN Israel. Shani Ferguson, Co-Founder of Yeshua Israel Ministries. And Albert Vexler, Deputy Director of Global Aliyah. And yes, they are all from Jerusalem. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Mati, tell me, some Palestinian people discount Mark Twain's famous book, Innocence Abroad. They don't like what it says. So I'm asking you, what would what would, the, what would Mark Twain's motive be for falsifying his log of 
his visit to the Holy Land? What would be the purpose? He's a famous journalist, writer. Uh, why would he suddenly falsify what he's writing? Well, I think the, the answer is obviously hidden inside the question. And you sort of hit the nail on the head with, you know, in the, in the question itself. He didn't. Mark Twain described what he saw in the land. You could say he was culturally biased, being you know, a white man from the West, but the point is that he travels and he sees a mostly barren, a mostly empty land, and he says, you know, here's a small Arab village and everything around it's empty. I'm walking down the road, everything's empty. Mm -hmm. There are no trees, there are no plants, there are no people. And in fact, when you go back to the census of the Ottoman Empire, and then later the, the British mandate, the population of the country at, at the time mm -hmm. was tiny. It was almost non-existent compared to what we have today. We're talking right. under half a million total at that time. Yes. So it's a very, very small population. And the Palestinians don't like it for obvious reasons because it's against their narrative of we were here, we were here in mass, this was our land, and so on and so forth. When in fact, it was a very small population, very backward right. population in the so country. So what excuses do you think? What, what, are, what are they saying? What are the Palestinians saying to discount? Well, I would, I would say a couple things. First of all, he's not the only person that visited the area known as Palestine at the time and said that there is... Um, a um, uh, letter, it's, it's something called like a letters uh, about Egypt and, wait, let me see if I can get the, uh, letters on Egypt, Edom, and the Holy Land written by Lord Lindsay, and that was back in the 1800s, 1837, and he wrote basically the same concept, that the land seems barren. Some people even think of it as cursed, waiting for their uh, long lost children that have been banished to return to the land and bring back the life that was there. He kind of described the place as dormant as opposed to uh, curse. But the other thing that I would say is that, I mean, anything that doesn't fit the narrative of, you know, the kind of Islamic Palestinian um, perspective, they're going to say is, is falsified. I mean, they, they don't recognize the Bible because it doesn't, it doesn't go with their narrative. They, they don't believe David built Jerusalem. They don't, I mean, there's just like this whole line of, of, of thought that they would simply consider false because it doesn't agree with their agenda. Let, let's just imagine that what Mark Twain has seen when he's walking down the country. Here's a man from a, a, a developed, he's from the U.S., from the, a developed Western country for the most part, and he comes to this place and what he sees is people living in complete squalor. They're living in, you know, in dirt huts, in broken down houses, in tents, in temporary mm -hmm. uh, houses. They're working the fields with, you know, traditional tools. They don't even know how to water the fields with, with piping or anything like that. It's all you know, uh, counting on the rain to water it. So mm -hmm. his, all, his entire experience is of one of, of poverty, of backwardness, of lack of development and culture. So I think that sort of, you know, is the undertone of everything he writes. And also I think the whole narrative of the Palestinian uh, claims, what, they, what they've um, developed, it has to do with the last hundred years. So when we talk about this period of time, really, I mean, this narrative was not around. So why should he falsify anything? There was no threat. There was no, uh, exactly. no reason for him to to uh, to say anything contrary to what he saw. So I'm wondering what the Palestinians have created in their mind. Are they seeing a land that was full of uh, Palestinians, uh, some famous tribe that had been living here for centuries? What? What, what did they, I wonder, have they really thought it through when they say, no, 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 that's not a true story. It, it wasn't like Mark Twain is saying. What, was, what are they here's, thinking? Here's the underlying story. If you take away the dramatic transformation of this land, you're undermining what God really did in Israel. That's the bottom line. Yeah. So what really happened is this country was in a really lousy state. I mean, I'm talking about the land, the people, everything, the economy. You know, it was barren. It was a desert. It was very, you know... It was uh, scarcely populated, and over a very short period of time, unparalleled anywhere else in the world, this country undergoes an incredible transformation. And you cannot not see God's hand in that. Right. We're talking the land, the people, the language, the culture. Mm -hmm. Everything is transformed in, the, in this place. And they want to say, no, 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 no. Uh, it actually didn't really change that much. What you see today was here. The reality is, is, you know, is exactly that. Yeah. This place has gone an, an incredible transformation. You cannot you know, not see God's hand right. in that, in those events. And uh, if, you, if you look at the history and the facts, really, then you see that um, the land was abandoned. Nobody really wanted it. It was a uh, Turkish province nobody mm -hmm. cared for. Mm -hmm. But the moment that the Jewish people, the owners, yeah. the prop, uh, what shall I say, 
the, the real owners of the land came back to their property. Then everything started to prosper. Then everything started to blossom and bloom. Mm -hmm. And that's what attracted them to come. Yes. And this is actually uh, seen in the uh, Ottoman Turkish uh, historical um, facts. You know, the, you, can, you can see that in the statistics that the, the growth of the population in the areas that the Jewish people were was 400 percent, which was um, more like three times more than the natural growth in the other areas that were not populated mm -hmm. with the Jewish people. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, I really love to go to places where I can sort of imagine how people lived even a few hundred years ago. Uh, I've been to Williamsburg in the States and I just love uh, that city because they have recreated, not even recreated, they just left it like it was and, and you can see how people lived a couple hundred years ago. But uh, a few years ago I was in Africa and I remember one of the greatest shocks that I had was when we went into a village at night and there is no light of any kind. They had nothing, nothing except maybe a few little candles. It's pitch black. So before the Jewish people came to Israel, started immigrating back, let's try to recreate how people lived in the 1800s. How did they live? What did they, what, what did they eat? Uh, did, were there imports? Well, how was it? Can how I do just you say that the greatest evidence of, of uh, at least in Arab culture, how they used to live is still alive today? Because uh, there are many people that hold to the traditions of uh, hundreds and hundreds of years of uh, nomadic and, and shepherding uh, agriculture, but or fishing. Um, so if you had Arabs living in the Jaffa area, then they would have been fishermen. If, if they were living out in the desert and they were nomadic, they, you can still go today, and the only difference is that they're out in their little tents with cable TV and cell phones because they've got a generator or something. But, but very much so, the, the, the lifestyle hasn't changed dramatically in that sense. When it comes to the Jewish population, they've developed, let's say, in technology, and of course there have yeah. been Arabs that have come along, and, and society as a whole in the last hundred years has developed dramatically with electricity and all that. But. Okay. I think there's, there's a bit of a problem making that comparison, though, just you know, to, to set the board for everyone watching this. 1800s, if you lived in, in the 1800s, if you lived in Europe, you experienced basically the 19th century. You experienced one of the biggest technological advance, uh, advancements in, you know, in mm -hmm. modern history, or actually yeah. history period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see you know, the introduction of the steam locomotive, of electricity, of pipelines, of, you know, of uh, urban planning, all these things that are now commonplace in the modern city or country. Even something as simple as pumping water Everything. or a shower. Everything that didn't exist. Baths. That didn't exist in this region. So when these people, the, the Westerners, come to Israel, none of that existed in this part. It's not just this land, this part of the world. And the Jews who came, came from a different world. The Jews coming from Europe, from Eastern Europe, they're coming from a more advanced world and right. bringing this technology in. So but let's go back before the Aliyah. Before the Aliyah, yeah. now we had maybe 10,000 Jews living in the Holy Land mm -hmm. in, in different little city. You know, they were small then. Everything was small then. How, what did, what were, why, did, why were these Jews here? What were they doing here? Well, the Jews have always been here. I mean, people might not know this, the Jews have always been here throughout history. This is all the way back to the Second Temple and also between the First and Second and Temple. And they've come in waves. They've, yeah. they've come in waves, especially when there was persecution. Even in the 17, 1700s, you had a wave of 1,500 Jews that came to the land with a leader who died subsequently three days after they arrived. But then the Ottomans burned down the synagogue and, you know, banned them from coming. But there was always there was waves always a presence. of thousands of people always a presence. and hundreds of people coming. And also, I think the... the the Jews that were there before the waves of the Aliyah, they were mostly religious Jews that, that uh, right. saw, saw this yeah. as a religious, uh, not just obligation, but a privilege to, to live in the land and pray in the land. So uh, I think uh, there is a, a huge difference also that, that was introduced when, when the uh, Aliyah, the first wave of Aliyah and the second and the third and the fourth wave came because then a totally other uh, type of thinking and uh, worldview was introduced. To the land. Definitely. But I mean, there was also a historical change, which was the fact that, you know, from, from a, a Muslim government, which was the Ottoman Empire, at the end of the First World War in 1917, the British took over the land. And the British, for the first time in a very long time, when General Allenby marched into Jerusalem in 1917, it was the first time in 500 years that Christians, or basically not Muslims, controlled the land. 
which meant that for the first time, non-Muslims could come to the land in numbers. So you had a very small and oppressed minority that suddenly had this freedom to practice religion, to come to the land that didn't exist right. till that point. Right. Well, that's all the time we have today at Israel Frontline. Thank you for watching. We hope this program gave you some background and insight into the spiritual way God is dealing with Israel behind the scenes. For more of my articles about Israel, sign up to the free monthly Mo's Israel Report at moesisrael.org slash sign up. Don't forget to join us next week for the second in the four part series about the restoration of Israel. We will talk about the early return of the Jewish pioneers to Israel, which started just over a hundred years ago. On behalf of our team and myself, Blessings and Shalom from Tel Aviv. I Stand with Israel is a benevolence outreach of Maoz Israel Ministries. Since its establishment in 2002, we have distributed over $4 million to meet the practical needs of Israelis, believers and non-believers. We support Arab believers and Ethiopian congregations. We provide financial aid and medical assistance. We grant education scholarships to students and children who study music. We partner with other ministries and sponsor conferences. We help individuals and businesses persecuted for their faith in Yeshua. Because of the generosity of our partners around the world, we have a privilege to help people in need, reaching out to them with the love of God in a practical way. We invite you to to stand with Israel. One of Mao's major activities is hosting nationwide conferences for Messianic believers and leaders in Israel. Events like Equip Conferences for Leaders, the Israel-China Kingdom Destiny Conference, and Promise Keepers Conferences help Israeli believers grow in faith and advance our vision. These conferences also establish strong connections within the worldwide body of Messiah and provide tools to reach the lost, from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth.